Harm Reduction, as Anarchist Practice, A User's Guide to Capitalism and Addiction in North America. By Christopher, B. R. Smith. Published June, 2012. Contents Abstract Introduction Background The New Anarchists, Harm Reduction and Institutionalization Anarchist Political Theory, The Founding Philosophy of Harm Reduction and the Reframing of Institutionalized Public Health Policy The Dope Fiend Ethic and the Spirit of Neoliberalism Reclaiming the Future of Harm Reduction as Anarchist Practice Conclusion a User's Guide to Capitalism and Addiction Acknowledgements Abstract In spite of its origins as an illegal, clandestine, grassroots activity that took place either outside or in defiant opposition to state and legal authority, there is growing evidence to suggest that harm reduction in North America has become sanitized and depoliticized in its institutionalization as public health policy. Harm reduction remains the most contested and controversial aspect of drug policy on both sides of the Canada, US border, yet the institutionalization of harm reduction in each national context demonstrates a series of stark contrasts. Drawing from regional case study examples in Canada and the US, this article historically traces and politically remaps the uneasy relationship between the autonomous political origins of harm reduction, contemporary public health policy, and the adoption of the biomedical model for addiction research and treatment in North America. Situated within a broader theoretical interrogation of the etiology of addiction, this study culminates in a politically engaged critique of traditional addiction research and drug-slash-service user autonomy. Arguing that the founding philosophy and spirit of the harm reduction movement represents a fundamentally anarchist-inspired form of practice, this article concludes by considering tactics for reclaiming and repoliticizing the future of harm reduction in North America. Keywords Public health Anarchism Addiction research Addiction treatment Needle exchange Supervised injection facility Harm Reduction Introduction Starting with the premise that the philosophy of harm reduction shares a number of unique parallels with the political philosophy of anarchism, this article examines how harm reduction practice in North America became depoliticized during its institutionalization as public health policy. Understanding depoliticization as the systemic exclusion of a structural, political economic critique in the etiology of addiction, this study traces the historical shift from grassroots, oppositional social movement to depoliticized institutional policy, interrogating the strategic alignment between harm reduction, the biomedical establishment, and the pathology paradigm. Rendering harm reduction as little more than an inflexible tool of the addiction as brain disease model, this analysis suggests that the resultant disconnect between contemporary public health policy and the oppositional roots of harm reduction practice has sanitized the latter, actively drawing attention away from the role of structural factors underpinning the phenomena of drug dependence. This article closes by reasserting the structural roots of addiction in late capitalist narcotic modernity and arguing for the depathologization of drug dependence. Positioning harm reduction as a fundamentally anarchist-inspired practice, this study is thereby posed as a user's guide to understanding the mutually constituting relationship between capitalism and addiction in North America. Background The New Anarchists, Harm Reduction, and Institutionalization The evolution of harm reduction is a story of compromise and co-optation, revealing evidence of an uneasy historical relationship with institutionalization. 
adopted as part of the European four-pillar approach to drug policy including prevention, treatment, and enforcement, harm reduction refers to interventions that seek to reduce the harms associated with substance use for individuals, families, and communities through a comprehensive range of coordinated, user-friendly, client-centered and flexible programs and services. In order to illustrate how the adoption of harm reduction by public health authorities has diluted the originary anarchist foundations of the movement, it is necessary to both detail the history of harm reduction's institutionalization, and contextualize the emergence of what Graeber termed the new anarchists. Prior to being institutionalized as public health policy following the 1980s AIDS epidemic, Harm reduction originated as an illegal activity where activists and politicized frontline workers risked arrest, by distributing clean syringes. Here, Stoller explores the origins of San Francisco's syringe program as an underground act of civil disobedience by a group of pagan, hippie anarchists. Footnote. In spite of its centrality to their organizational structure, owing to acute public discomfort with the term anarchism, the group consistently attempted to downplay their political orientation. Featuring on a list of things not to say to the media, Stoller noted members were urged to conceal their political leanings, such as anarchism or paganism. End footnote. Whose uneasy relationship to civic authority slowly negated the group's original anarchist principles. Established as a direct result of the mid-80s moral panic surrounding HIV-AIDS among inner-city injection drug users, the earliest institutionalized harm reduction measures in Europe were needle exchange programs. Although it continues to remain absent in American policy discourse, harm reduction was formally introduced in Canada with the 1987 establishment of Canada's drug strategy. Footnote. Within one year of taking office, Canadian Prime Minister Stephen Harper unveiled the Conservative government's national anti-drug strategy in 2007. Based on a three-prong approach including prevention, treatment, and enforcement, the new strategy suggested harm reduction was being written out of Canadian drug policy altogether. Moreover, signaling a return to moral criminological ideologies, responsibility for the new anti-drug strategy was shifted from Health Canada to the Department of Justice. End footnote. As a rational and pragmatic response to addiction, Harm reduction recognizes drug use as an inescapable fact, rather than a moral issue, and seeks to reduce the individual and social costs of abuse rather than to eliminate all drug use per se, thereby reframing drug user behavior in practical terms of cost-benefit analysis rather than ideology. Here, the cost-benefit or bottom-line analysis of harm reduction is a calculation based not only on users' drug-related harms, but also the larger social costs of addiction. Concerns regarding public order and public safety have constituted perhaps the primary justification for institutional harm reduction interventions. From this perspective, it is relevant to raise the question. Whose harm does harm reduction policy seek to mitigate and reduce? That of the drug and or service user, or the social body politic? Contemporaneous to the institutional adoption of the biomedical disease model, neoliberal health policy served to demedicalize the subject of addiction treatment, variously re-articulating the inbuilt relations of authority underlying patient in the terms of client or consumer. Here, the former patient is transformed into a client of treatment services whose counterpart is the treatment service provider. The displacement of doctor or patient by the client or provider dynamic is, however, further complicated by the notion of consumption, catalyzing a subsequent metamorphosis into the unambiguous designation consumer. Composed of a plural and shifting materiality, in the alchemy of substitution treatment, the consumption of methadone therefore takes the place of junk. In recognition of the deceptive medicine as business rationality underlying the designations client and consumer, effectively resituating subjects in a passive, one-way relationship to capitalist forces of production and consumption, this essay employs the term user in reference to both harm reduction and drug treatment subjects, positing the designation drug and or service user as a potentially productive, fluid interchangeability. Suggesting institutionalization has effectively sanitized harm reduction's oppositional political origins, 
Rowe articulates a historic tension between those who see the movement as a medical means of promoting health and mitigating harm, and a more activist faction positing harm reduction as a platform for broader and more structural social change. Institutional harm reduction advocates, Rowe asserts, engage in cooperation with state bodies ignorant to the fact that the health problems they address are substantially created by the ideology of the systems in which they work. Politicized proponents, by contrast, focus on a structural critique involving a political analysis of risk and harm as byproducts of social, economic, racial, or political inequality. A byproduct of the branding accompanying the reversal of harm reduction from a bottom up movement to a top down policy, Rowe suggests that harm reduction policy rooted in cost benefit analysis may merely represent a new guise of control designed to minimize risk from, and maximize control over, marginal populations such as drug and or service users. Harm reduction as public health policy, as Keane similarly concludes, thus avoids confronting the very things that produce the most harm for drug users. Drug laws, dominant discourses of drug use, and the stigmatization of users. Approximately corresponding to the dawn of harm reduction's global institutionalization, and building on the 1960s avant-garde notion of, the revolution of everyday life, radical leftist movements underwent a series of shifts, away from utopian notions of revolution, and toward what Bay termed ontological anarchy, and the insurrectionist model of the temporary autonomous zone. In his analysis of the political logic of the newest social movements, Day describes how contemporary activists have repudiated universalizing conceptions of social change, instead emphasizing, an anarchist logic of affinity, centrally driven by direct action. Examining what he terms the new anarchists, Graeber defines direct action as, rejection of a politics which appeals to governments to modify their behavior, in favor of physical intervention against state power, in a form that prefigures an alternative. Abandoning the rhetoric of state revolution, in favor of everyday expressions of resistance, rooted in autonomy and affinity, Graeber suggests that direct action tactics are, less about seizing state power, than exposing, delegitimatizing and dismantling mechanisms of rule, while winning ever larger spaces of autonomy from it. Fundamentally premised on the notion of autonomy, both Day's arguments concerning the logic of affinity, and Graeber's contentions regarding direct action, resonate closely with Bay's notion of the temporary autonomous zone, or TAZ. An uprising which does not engage directly with the state. A guerrilla operation that liberates an area, of land, of time, of imagination and then dissolves itself to reform elsewhere else when, before the state can crush it. In this sense, Bayes' TAZ resembles what Delos and Guattari termed rhizomes. Multiplicitous and non-hierarchical forces, that establish connections between semiotic chains, organizations of power, and social struggles. A self-described, ex-workers collective, the contemporary US anarchist network, crime think, embodies the spirit of Graeber's new anarchism. Provocatively concluding, you may already be an anarchist, crime thinks fighting for our lives begins by recounting historical instances of struggle and mutual support, posing anarchism as a praxis of everyday life. Quote, Whenever you act without waiting for instructions or official permission, you are an anarchist. Any time you bypass a ridiculous regulation when no one's looking, you are an anarchist. If you don't trust the government, to know better than you when it comes to things that affect your life, that's anarchism too. And you are especially an anarchist when you come up with your own ideas and initiatives and solutions. Quote. Borrowing from Crime Think's romantically accessible rendering, this article understands anarchism as the generalized political logic of contemporary, radical social movements, composed by everyday practices of resistance, grounded in the notions of autonomy, affinity, and direct action. Anarchist Political Theory, The Founding Philosophy of Harm Reduction, and the Reframing of Institutionalized Public Health Policy
Extending this framework, it is crucial to account for the ways that the institutionalization of harm reduction has confined the anarchist spirit of the movement. Sharing a startling number of commonalities, a comparative analysis of the basic principles underlying social anarchism, and the founding philosophy of harm reduction, illustrates the direct correlations between institutionalization and depoliticization. Moreover, examining the parallels between anarchist praxis, and harm reduction theory, reveals the implications of institutionalization, and attendant discursive slash political reframing of harm reduction as public health policy. Along with discursive slash political reframing of public health policy itself. The above mentioned aspects of new anarchism, extend directly from the founding principles of social anarchism. Anti-authoritarianism, distrust of hierarchy, and mutual aid. Directly related to the notion of autonomy, anti-authoritarianism typically manifests as the rejection of state governance, and its decentralized institutions of legal and biomedical control. Captured in the sentiment, no gods, no masters. Most manifestations of social anarchism are also inherently non-hierarchical, standing against any form of hierarchy premised on, race and or ethnicity, gender and or sexuality, religion, or social class. Mutual aid, the third principle of social anarchism, represents a direct expression of affinity, that often manifests in intentional communities living outside conventional society. The core values of anarchism are reflected in many elements of the founding philosophy, if not always the actual practice, of harm reduction. Growing out of the oppositional spirit of the movement, harm reduction discourse might therefore be seen as a disguised language developed to describe an emergent anarchist model of care for capitalism's most oppressed, yet symptomatic victims. The recognition of addiction as a health issue as opposed to a moral criminological question represents perhaps the central founding trope of harm reduction. Correspondingly, the universal adoption of the addiction as disease paradigm can be understood as the central engine behind the institutionalization of harm reduction. Actively obscuring the role of structural factors, the biomedical model instead locates addiction in the static intersection of substance and subject, suturing up drug dependence as a case of faulty neuro-slash-chemical circuitry. Returning to our comparative analysis, anti-authoritarian direct action, manifests in harm reduction, when frontline service providers elevate the value of users' experiential knowledge, over biomedical authorities. Here, in perhaps the most progressive, read, anarchist, models, the service provider would be a peer, thus circumventing obvious forms of authoritarian control. Footnote. Martin suggests that, because no one officially runs Alcoholics Anonymous, the 12-step movement represents the world's largest functioning anarchy. Issuing any formal relationship to biomedical authorities, Robinson notes that Alcoholics Anonymous aspires to remain uninvolved in outside philosophical, political, or social issues. The notion of powerlessness in the first step, however, represents a significant source of contention regarding the ideological underpinnings of the movement, particularly in relation to gender. End footnote. While reframing addiction in the terms of pathology, merely results in a shift from criminological, to biomedical forms of hierarchical authority. Footnote, i.e. the clinical gaze of epidemiologists, addiction doctors, treatment counselors, and public health scientists, and footnote. The ethical, and human rights imperatives, of direct user involvement in harm reduction, are encapsulated in the global drug users mantra. Nothing about us, without us where lack of agency commitment may reflect the transgression of normative hierarchical authority. Combined with its ostensibly, user-friendly, client-centered approach, the mandated inclusion of drug-slash-service users in some forms of harm reduction, further illustrates the movement's non-hierarchical orientation. Footnote. For manuals, best practices, and lessons learned regarding user involvement, in the development and delivery of harm reduction policy, see, Toronto Harm Reduction Task Force. Mason. Canadian Harm Reduction Network. Canadian HIV-AIDS Legal Network.
and Cheng and Smith. End footnote. The non-hierarchical, direct action nature of harm reduction practice is demonstrated, in models based on a strong emphasis on user inclusion, in every dimension of service by equitably engaging users, in a condition of collaborative autonomy. Extending this argument, the articulation of harm reduction as an ethical, and human rights issue, represents an overt discourse of affinity and mutual aid. Here, it is important to emphasize that in North America, the institutionalization of harm reduction was catalyzed by an underground, oppositional network of people, living, working, and dying in the streets. Evidenced in tactical affinity-based alliances with other marginal urban populations, such as people with HIV AIDS, the logic of affinity manifests in a multiplicity of harm reduction interventions, representing both the essence of its radical origins, and the force with the most potential to repoliticize practice. Established by the direct action tactics of the radical, AIDS coalition to unleash power. The establishment of Pennsylvania's first syringe exchange program provides a telling case in point. The Dope Fiend Ethic, and the Spirit of Neoliberalism Narrow biopolitical analyses of drug-slash-service users function to reproduce binary structures, albeit radically inverted. Reframing illicit drug use as an expression of freedom and resistance, such critiques articulate the state of, outlaw addiction, encapsulated in Borges and Schoenberg's Righteous Dope Fiend, a distorted representation of United States rugged individualism, reflecting the broken record dreamscape of late capitalist America. Here, the righteous dope fiend forms a typology of deviance, not only actively produced by the intoxicating infrastructure of post-industrial narcotic modernity, but also central to its operation of control. Considering the righteous dope fiend ethic in relation to the United States war on drugs, Perhaps the most contested element of harm reduction is the movement's supposed, value-free, amoral stance toward drug use. Given the contested, physical, ideological, and discursive, battlefield of the war on drugs, in other words, claiming an amoral position in fact, euphemistically, articulates a radical revisioning of addiction. Moreover, perhaps the supposed amorality of harm reduction masks something more sinister, beneath the process of institutionalization. Insidious neoliberalism, disguised as progressive practice, played out on the stage of public health. Given its self-legitimating ideology, Granfield argues that harm reduction's central adherence to the biomedical model of addiction, is hegemonic. Following from the explicitly political origins of harm reduction, however, the phenomenon of addiction cannot be reduced to questions of pathology, but instead represents a direct symptom, of the social, political, and economic forces of late capitalist modernity. According to this reconceptualization, the neoliberal phase, of our narcotic modernity, assumes the locus and engine of disease, situating drug dependence as an adaptive response, to the forces of control and exploitation that make up its experiential landscape. Although varying articulations of this critique appeared much earlier, Footnote. For example, see Cocteau. I therefore became an opium addict, again, because the doctors who cure. One should really say, quite simply, who purge. Do not seek to cure the troubles which cause the addiction. I had found, again, my unbalanced state of mind, and I preferred an artificial equilibrium to no equilibrium at all. End footnote. Tabers, capitalism plus dope, equals genocide, bears direct relevance to this discussion. An imprisoned member of the Black Panther Party, Tabor wrote, drug addiction is a social phenomenon, that grows organically from the capitalist system. The government, he continued, is totally incapable of addressing the true causes of drug addiction, for, to do so, would necessitate affecting a radical transformation of this society. Conventional drug treatment programs, Tabor concluded, do not deal with the causes of the problem, 
deliberately negating the socio-economic origin of drug addiction. While this trajectory explicitly calls for revolutionary change, contemporary social movements often issue totalizing conceptions of state overthrow, instead, forming temporary spaces of autonomous resistance, beyond the gaze of institutional authority. Before the utopian revolution, in other words, activists continue to work for change within the present system, where anarchism forms a common feature of frontline harm reduction practice, manifesting in subtle forms that often fall outside the radar of public health authorities. Reaffirming the founding anarchist spirit of harm reduction, we might, therefore, refer back to crime thinks insistence. You are, especially, an anarchist when you come up with your own ideas and initiatives and solutions. Underground Crack Kit Distribution Abandoning one-for-one -one exchange, in favor of syringe distribution. Actively encouraging unsanctioned secondary distribution. Peer-based naloxone training. Bathrooms inside harm reduction organizations, acting as informal safe injection sites. Clandestine abogaine treatment teams. Sympathetic physicians, writing narcotic scripts under the guise of pain management. Footnote. Stemming primarily from the author's cumulative ethnographic observations, at harm reduction and addiction treatment sites in Canada, Toronto, and the United States, Philadelphia. Further evidence of these phenomena can be found in numerous media references. For controversy surrounding, safer crack use kits, see, Fox News and Bailey. Concerning syringe conflict, see, Hunter. Regarding Ibogaine, see Alper, et al., and Hamilton. And footnote. In such instances, the radical spirit of harm reduction persists, shifting from political ideal, to everyday practice, directly informed by a relationship of collaborative autonomy with the drug-slash-service user. Here, the anarchist principles fueling such manifestations of harm reduction, again suggest a rhizomatic movement, with the potential to resist the inevitability underlining Weber's depiction of institutionalization, constituting a horizontal multiplicity of forces, based on connection and heterogeneity, that may be shattered in a given spot, but will start up again. Reclaiming the future of harm reduction, as anarchist practice. Working toward repoliticization, it is necessary to trace different models for integrating anarchism. Or, rather, the fundamental political spirit of harm reduction. Into the very fabric of everyday life, where anarchist expressions of harm reduction are already happening, both from within, and from without. In the first case, harm reduction is being reclaimed, through underground, autonomous acts, of resistance, however temporary, and the establishment of informal, off-the-books practices. Perhaps such tactics take place, so easily and so often, simply because public health authorities have little conception of the, on-the-ground pragmatics, of harm reduction practice. Frontline workers can get away with so much, in other words, largely because the bureaucrats who dictate policy are seldom, able to understand, the everyday reality of providing care for those, whose lives are dominated by the harsh, hyper-capitalist black market economies of power, created by the war on drugs. At the other end of the spectrum, by contrast, the anarchist spirit persists, in organized efforts, to radicalize drug policy. Spanning a broad range of factions. From the United States Drug Policy Alliance, to the Canadian Students for Sensible Drug Policy, and from radical academics, to autonomous drug user networks. Such groups work toward reorienting the future of harm reduction by directly engaging the state, fighting for voices, at the tables of power. Repoliticizing the future of harm reduction, therefore, entails several immediate points of departure. First, harm reduction needs to be reconceptualized, as a living document, creating fluid, in slash formal spaces, where practice can adapt, 
to accommodate changing community needs. Second, politicized policy actors, user groups, activists, and academics need to radicalize the terms of debate surrounding addiction, by challenging stigma, deconstructing the disease model, and revealing the structural forces that create, and perpetuate harm. Here, shifting away from the quantitative, epidemiological tradition, in drug research, is equally important to increasing capacity building efforts, toward collaborative autonomy. In reclaiming the future of practice, it is therefore imperative, to place users at the very center of harm reduction, resituating people with lived experience, as the driving force behind the radical, political spirit of the movement. Conclusion A User's Guide to Capitalism and Addiction Comparing these different trajectories, we might conclude that the United States is characterized by the innovation of practical, albeit largely underground, models of everyday resistance within the decidedly more repressive war on drugs. Evidenced in the establishment of the first, and only, sanctioned supervised injection facility in North America, the Canadian experience, on the other hand, has been distinguished by progressive policy reform, leading to the widespread policy embrace of harm reduction. Acknowledging the accomplishments of grassroots, United States practitioners, where harm reduction does not even enter official policy discourse, what are the consequences of Canada's more advanced stage of institutionalized harm reduction, as measured in the cost-benefit terms of depoliticization? While Canada's experience is commonly celebrated, interventions, such as supervised injection sites, seek to manage drug users in the interests of public order, prompting criticism that such programs lack focus on underlying structural issues, thus merely representing a new form of governmentality. Yet another deceptive strategy to minimize risk from, and maximize control over, the bodies and behaviors of nonconformist, illicit, consumers. Enlarging the scope of critique, Miller asserts, the claim of amorality due to harm minimization's scientific basis is, a moralistic claim in itself, which furthers the standpoint that science and objectivity are preferable to other forms of knowledge. Owing to its perceived methodological objectivity, science, particularly public health science conducted in the name of harm reduction, is consistently positioned as the antithesis to ideologically based claims regarding drugs. Although its underlying foundations are seldom questioned, it is a matter of fact, that science is always already ideological. Blindly clinging to its ostensible objectivity, science can never advance an explicitly political position. Furthermore, because quantitative data can neither represent experience, nor convey the voices of research subjects, biomedical inquiry is, fundamentally, unable to engage in a structural critique of addiction. Although social research cannot, single-handedly, fix institutional public health policy, or automatically realign harm reduction with its anarchist origins. To re-emphasize Rowe's argument, politically committed, theoretically engaged forms of social research, based on true collaborative autonomy with users, can actively work toward repoliticizing the future of harm reduction practice, by engaging in a direct political critique of the social and legal systems that create harm. Footnote. This is a challenge to academics, policy experts, and service providers, reads the Vancouver Area Network of Drug Users, Manifesto for a Drug User Liberation Movement, 2010. We do not want to be used as cheap labor, we do not want to be studied while we die, or be turned into clients, while resources are given to service agencies. We will not tolerate actions that exploit the labor, activist work, or experiences, of people who use drugs. Finally, we expect responsible researchers, experts, and academics, to support us. End footnote. In Alexander's terms, addiction professionals must change the terms of debate on addiction, by acknowledging capitalism's role in mass-producing addiction, and refuting the reduction of addiction to a drug problem, or a disease.
playfully rephrasing the terms of this struggle, in the form of an equation, if as in Tabor's manifesto. Capitalism, plus dope, equals genocide. Then borrowing from Stoller, we might conclude that genocide, plus anarchism, equals harm reduction. Framed as a user's guide, to late capitalist narcotic modernity, this article suggests the expression, fighting for our lives, embodies the political project of harm reduction, in its new anarchist, user-driven manifestations. Returning to the United States Anarchist Collective, Crime Think, this article closes with a prayer, that bears directly on the struggle between harm reduction, institutionalization, and depoliticization. Thank the heavens, we have nothing. Help us not to hate the ones we must destroy. On the back cover of the publication, read the words. The future is unwritten.